The Secret of the Plumed Serpent. The Ritual of Initiation. In the healer's house, time passed almost unnoticeably, as treating my wounds and performing purification tasks. I received a huge amount of information about medicinal herbs and healing techniques, which at first I took for part of my healing treatment. Before long, however, I realized that there were more to it than meeting the eye. For Danya Sovia, purification. Meant freeing ourselves from the horrendous emotional load we carry. Only through deliberate acts, such as recapitulation techniques, cleansing, and the strengthening of the body, can such purification help free an individual of that load. The religious atmosphere. And the stories we listened to every night helped create a separate, almost fantasy world within me. Little by little, this world took possession of my mind. I had always had an overdeveloped imagination, so in no time at all, I found myself sharing alien concepts. That not so long ago would have been utterly unacceptable to me. Understanding the customs and the mentality of the healers could prove to be more complex than one might have expected. In daily life, people identify with them for their clarity and religious piety. But at night, their hidden face comes into view with their nasty, almost heretical stories, in which they play roles of traditional mythical characters and ancient gods. Their tales are populated by angels, demons, and infernal beasts. Which, according to them, roam the forests and the mountains. I believed I was immune to those silly little tales of terror, until I found myself reacting apprehensively to certain things that had no business existing. The healers had managed to sow seeds of doubt in my heart. In the beginning, when I first got there, my retiring ways separated me from the others, which gave the healers the perfect opportunity to frighten me and set me up with all manners of practical jokes. One of the sickest pranks was that when I found a pair of discarded old sandals. By a pile of rubbish, they appeared to have no owner, so I grabbed them, thinking of mending and using them myself. Because the shoes I wore were not very comfortable, I took them to the small room I had been allocated at one side of the house. Left them in a corner and went to bed to rest, planning to work on them on another occasion. I was half asleep when I heard a noise. At first, I believed I was dreaming, but the noise became stronger. Worried it might be a rat or some other animal, I woke up just in time. To experience the greatest scare of my life. In semi-darkness, I saw the sandals move by themselves, 
and actually walk out of the room. My whole body broke out in goose flesh. I believe I fainted from fright, because the next thing I remember was Danya and Sylvia tending to me with a wet cloth and water in a washing basin. I told her what had happened. She laughed and jokingly said, "I'd probably seen a ghost." But I rejected that explanation, preferring to believe I had had a hallucination, which, because of my weakness, made me lose concise. I could, however, see that the sandals had really disappeared. Another story worth mentioning happened during a period of extraordinary drought. Even the well from which we drew water had dried up, which forced us to walk a distance of two miles in order to fetch water. I remember ruminating at the time on the contradiction. Of being able to travel through the universe with one's dreaming body, while being at the mercy of the basic laws of everyday life a moment later. It so happened that on one occasion, as I went along lugging my pails full of water, the Nagua blocked my way. It appeared to me in the form of a disgusting beast that seemed to have two ears on each side of the head and an enormous pair of horns. Its eyes were like those of a fine bull, with a snout full of crooked, pointed teeth. Its growl was so loud and inhuman. That I dropped the pails and ran away from there like a shot. I ran so hard that I must have fainted, since to this day I can't remember how I got to the house. When I regained the conscious, two of the grandparents were tending to me. The healer's crowning strategy was that, when the time came for me to be accepted as an assistant, they prepared for me a ceremony of initiation containing a ver variety of demonic elements. I said I didn't take it seriously, but even then, the truth was that. Within myself, I was trembling with fear. The ceremony took place after I had recovered from my wounds and accepted my role among them. It is a good example of the magisterial way in which the healers took advantage of my fear. One day, Danya Sobe announced that, at the next full moon, an initiation ceremony for me would be held. I accepted her invitation enthusiastically because I considered it to be a real honor. She warned me, however, that those who took part in those ceremonies became changed forever. And would never be the same again. I remember paying little attention to her comments, being more worried about the ceremony itself. I was concerned about the procedures, but the healers would give me no details or explanations of what was going to happen. On the night of the ceremony, 
We got out of the house together, and walked a long way in the darkness, until we got to a place where a group of people was gathered around a bonfire. As we approached them, Danya Sovia indicated that I should sit down on a rock in the form of a chair. That was at one end of the group, next to the fire. I noticed then that thick clouds had hidden the full moon, that only a short while ago helped us by illuminating our way to the meeting place. Without the moon, the scene seemed even more somber. The nearby waterfall made a thunderous noise. I could recognize the song of various night birds. It gave the finishing touch to the scene, which looked like something out of a thriller. By firelight, the participants looked like a circle of spectres. That had emerged from another time. I could see some of the healers' assistants among them, and was surprised to spot some of the patients and even neighbors I had seen in Danya Silva's house. The group consisted of both young and old people. We were little more than a dozen. I noticed that the others were regarding me with curiosity. I felt troubled, and a bit out of place, and hated being in a position where I was attracting attention. I had never taken part in a ceremony of this type before, and consequently didn't know how to proceed, which filled me with anxiety and anticipation. The participants began chanting in a very low voice. I could not make out what they were singing, but the melody had a hypnotic rhythm that made me feel a kind of longing for something I could not define. After what seemed to me a very long wait, the deep silence was broken. By the peculiar sound of conchs and drums, the rhythm soon became frenzied, and then, seemingly appearing out of nothing, a man covered with the skin of a wolf or a coyote sprang out of the darkness. He spun around, dancing in a strange manner. Performed a number of capers, and then approached the fire. From his behavior and the performance, I understood that he was a sorcerer. A moment later, the masked man came up to me. Without a single word, he extended his hand as if to greet me. I began raising my right hand in answer to his greeting, but he grabbed me left hand, and with tremendous speed made a deep cut between my fingers. The cut bled profusely. I was filled with fear and anger, and would have fled that place of madness if I hadn't been paralyzed by profound terror. At that point, I had become somewhat numb, and was feeling that my vision was darkening. I thought I was going to lose conscious, but I recovered straight away. Then the sorcerer came towards me and, in a strangely hoarse, deep voice, that seemed to hail from beyond the grave. Ordered me to get up and to take off all my clothes, adding that 
I should keep my eyes closed. His words had a huge force and an authority I could not disobey. The unfamiliarity of the situation prevented me from feeling embarrassed by standing there naked before all those people. At a certain moment, I felt that the sorcerer was blowing softly over my skin. I also sensed that he was cleansing me with aromatic herbs while praying or murmuring something unintelligible. He cleansed me with smoke and with fire in the same way. I could see a torch move up and down, repeatedly rubbing my skin. Then, at a certain moment, I felt a warm and a sticky liquid pour down on my head, oozing all over my body and producing a pleasant sensation of being wrapped in a protective cloak. When the sorcerer finally said I could open my eyes, I did and felt my gorge rise. I was red all over covered in blood, and on top of a rock, there lay the lifeless body of an animal. I wanted to protest, but the solemnity of the occasion prevented me. Next, I was taken to the waterfall, where I was given a ritual bath resembling baptism with water. The water was cold, but felt very pleasant to my body, which was burning with heat. After washing off the blood that had dyed me red, drying and dressing myself, I returned to the circle and took my place by the fire. I had hardly sat down when the participants started passing around baskets full of peyote buttons. I knew of peyote from literature, mainly from Carlos's books. But even though I felt great curiosity, it had never occurred to me to try it. I was fearful and prejudiced, but also very curious. When the basket got round to me, still wrapped up in my thoughts, I took a button and placed it in front of me. I considered the possibility of refusing, but at the same time wanted the experience. Without giving much thought to my fears and mistrust, I grabbed the button and started chewing. Its awfully bitter and pungent taste made it difficult to swallow. My stomach was the worst affected. It felt like an independent entity protesting violently. Each of us took a button and chewed it in silence. We sat there together for a long time, eating the buttons. As the hours went by, some participants got up to vomit or dispersed towards the far ends of the area, while others remained seated with their eyes closed, humming in a low voice. I experienced the powerful effect of the plant as a river of light flooding my being. In the light, there was a man, or a man-like form, motioning with his, his hand for me to approach. I was not afraid, 
knowing him to be a vision brought about by the peyote button. My curiosity was so great that I came closer. What I saw was an extraordinary being, green of color and resembling a marshmallow. Its eyes were striking. I felt that this strange being was a friend whom I could trust. It spoke into my ear, told me its name, and talked about my life. It told me I had to learn to forgive in order to be free, and then sang a song to me, a song that is with me even today. I saw the being depart, perceiving it as a greenish light disappearing amidst the vegetation until it completely vanished. Very slowly, I regained the awareness of my surroundings. At a certain moment, as it dawned, the sorcerer came up to me and took off his mask. The state of awareness I was in helped to lessen my fright. The sorcerer was the very phantom I had seen in the crypt years ago. I was confused more than ever. I was afraid, but still felt I knew him well and remembered him from my dreaming. The sorcerer introduced himself, saying his name was Melchor Ramos. He knew I had been accepted by the hickory, he said, and he welcomed me into the present company. Then he started giving me instructions. He said that I should gaze at the fire until the devil appeared to me. Some of the participants had made a spiral with the embers from the bonfire. With some apprehension, I did as he suggested. I felt like in a dream as I gazed at the embers. Or perhaps I did fall asleep or lose consciousness, because the next thing I knew was that I was hurtling down a black hole. All of a sudden, I found myself inside a monumental cavern that seemed to be kilometers high with enormous stalactites and stalagmites that looked like monuments representing beings from another world. The walls exuded a fluorescent, greenish, ghostly sheen. The roof was exquisitely beautiful. Its dome appeared to be teeming with stars so many and so high that I was sure it could only be a dream or a vision. While I gazed in ecstasy at that place, which in the semi-darkness looked like a vision of another world, I believed myself to be alone. Slowly, however, I noticed other persons there with me. Suddenly, I recognized Dania Sylvia and her companions seemingly appearing out of nothingness. I felt that if I were to focus on them, they would materialize. As I regarded them, a voice that seemed to be Don Melkor's said that we were sharing dreaming, and that this was my real initiation test. 
I managed to steady my attention, and saw Don Melchor as he spoke to me. He said that he had been entrusted with guiding me through the mysteries of the healers, and that today, as a gift of welcome into their company, he was going to teach me a trick of entering dreaming. He said that all one needed in order to enter dreaming was a profound desire to do so. As he spoke, Don Melchor moved his eyes in a strange way, as if to help me grasp something one could not express in words. He went on to say that the technique consisted of concentration. And silencing the mind, and that, in order to help me, he would give me a gift of power. He reached up into the air with his hand, like a stage magician, and took out of nowhere a beautiful white feather, reflecting the greenish light of the place. You are dreaming right now. Because the energy of the hikari had helped you get here this first time around, but to accompany us on other occasions, you'll have to reach us on your own. This feather will help you," he said, handing me the glittering feather. My joy knew no limits that memorable night. What I had believed was a common group of unsophisticated healers was, in fact, a group of teachers of dreaming. I learned many things on that occasion. Each one of the healers spoke to me in turn. Giving me advice and teaching me maneuvers for entering and getting out of the other world. Even today, I do not remember the transition. When I woke up, the sun was already high on the horizon. I was holding a white feather in my hand. After the ritual, I had several opportunities to talk to Dama Kor, but always only briefly. At the time, I was still under the impression that they were a religious order whose job was healing people. It was their job only in a manner of speaking, however. Because they did not receive any money for the consultations, their subsistence was very humble. Yet they lacked nothing. They worked in the fields. That and the gifts they received were enough for them to have a good life. It was hard for me to speak to Don Melchor. He inspired in me a kind of fear or respect that discouraged long conversations. Things were direct with him. Everything was pure action, and matters were resolved badly if need be. There were no half turns with him. Even if you couldn't swim, he would throw you in the water, so to speak. We always went around Don Melchor very carefully. He frequently repeated these words: "We are all going to die, and there is no other way. It's only a question of time." So you are already dead. What more is there for you to lose? 
If we look at things that way, the world is our oyster. In his lessons, he said, "Life is a fleeting event in the internal flow of energy. Death is what gives it meaning." Modern man's confusion comes from thinking that organic life and awareness are one and the same, but that is a mistake, caused by lack of experience of dreaming. The healer's teaching hinges on the point that, to all intents and purposes, we are already dead. Merely knowing the fact. Helps us live strong lives and make irreversible decisions. One day, Don Melchor said to me, "Death is real. It is a process of initiation. You must always bear in mind that you are already dead. You died the day when you were attacked there on the hill." Now you must live a new life. There are only two types of people: those who consider themselves immortal, and those who know that they are going to die. Do not get distracted. There to look at your imminent end. The awakening is now or never. Not wanting to disturb him at an inappropriate moment, I waited long for an opportunity to approach Don Melchor with my questions. One morning, I found him in the granary arranging some wooden boxes. I went over to him and asked him if he would be so kind to answer a few questions. He replied, "I've already told you more than once that you can ask me about anything you like. It isn't necessary to go through so many formalities." At the time, my questions were about the ritual I had been through, but nobody seemed keen to discuss the subject. In addition. I was consumed by the desire to establish whether Don Melchor had been the phantom in the cathedral. Another one of my priorities was to find out about the symbolism of the ritual and the pact with the devil. My intention was to ask about the phantom. Instead of which, I pleaded, "Dama Kor, please tell me something about the ritual of initiation in which I took a part." He smiled. "We'll talk about it right now," he said, and set aside the tools he had been working with. We sat down on some empty tomato boxes. I believe the game has gone long enough. It is important that there is no misunderstanding in this matter. The ritual we participated in was prepared specially for you. Having said that, he gave me an inquisitive look. What he said was no news to me, because I had already been informed that the ritual was to represent my admission to the healer's world. That ritual was unique, he continued. It was designed just for you. I don't understand. Everyone has a ritual initiation, don't they? No, he replied. That was the only time that we'd done something like that. But why for me? I asked frantically. 
I thought you were devil worshippers of some sort, masquerading as Christians. Don Melkor laughed a great deal and said they'd put on that particular show to help me break loose of my moorings, and that they'd based it on my morbid and ritualistic personality. You see. He said, "Your initiation ritual had much more depth to it than you can remember at this moment. That night, we used your fear to propel you into dreaming, and it worked. In the ritual, I told you to find the lost duck." I was sure you wouldn't even know the meaning of that word, but that you the intuit it. The important thing was the shock it gave to your body, and that went very well. We achieved our goal. What do you mean by that? I asked. We were looking to put you in the state of total awareness. And there is nothing better than fear to achieve this. Once the ritual acts and the power plants had opened you up, you were ready to enter into the other world, but you needed one final push. That was when I told you to look at the fire. Remember? I was able to recall the scene vaguely. As if it had been part of a dream. That kind of rite serves to open the apprentice. The use of power plants, more than fear, and the anticipation caused by the ceremony, produces the movement of your assemblage point. It takes one to the magic world directly. Without the need for preliminary steps, the events that had taken place during the ritual remained hidden from my daily awareness for years, and it took me a long time to remember them. In the world of daily affairs, I went on with my usual chores. Believing that in my initiation, I had seen the devil and was given a feather by helpful spirits for my protection. I even went as far as to believe that the feather had aided me in a life or death battle against the demons that hung on by my side, tried to prevent me from becoming a healer. With time, I understood that the demons I thought I'd seen were my own demons. A vision brought about by the lamentable state of being I was in. Some times later, while walking with Don McCor towards the hills. I noticed that he was wearing the same old sandals I had previously found. I knew they were the same ones because of a small metal staple fastening a torn piece of leather on the right sandal. <laughs>